just sit right back and hear a tale, a tale of a fateful trip that started from this tropic port aboard this tiny ship. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's so great to be here with you today, and I know that you uh, have heard some commentary if you've been with us the past couple of weeks about this walk-up music that they have, um, but I wasn't quite happy with not having my own walk-up music, so thankfully, I'm married to the sound guy, so he put something <laughs> different on for me. That's right. That's right. Yep. And I am batting cleanup. That's who they chose to bat cleanup. That's what I'm saying today. All right. <laughs> anyway, so my name is Heather. For those of you that don't know me, I'm the director of worship here at Crossway. And I don't get to speak very often, but I'm excited when I get the opportunity to do that. And I always bring something fun to do when I do that. And um, I want to remind you that we're in the series of Jonah. And if you might have missed the previous messages, maybe it's your first time joining us today online or something like that, I just want to give you a little recap of what we've been doing. First of all, Pastor Tony started us off talking about how Jonah was unsure when God called him. And when we're unsure, we shouldn't run because that's not the answer, as we'll be reminded of later when we review the story. Um, and then the next week, Pastor Sean talked about being uncomfortable and being in the belly of a fish sometimes isn't very comfortable, uh, but sometimes God needs to walk us through that. And then last week, Pastor Joel talked to us about being unequipped and how God's power is often made perfect in our weakness and he is enough for us. And so today we're going to look at Jonah chapter 4 at the end of our story where our friend Jonah will be ungrateful. So we went through all of those uns. And I have a request with our kids table in the back. I need two volunteers and I think Miss Susan was helping me with that, but I um we're going to review the story and I brought motivation for you to participate in the story. So I'm gonna ask a few questions, and then I got two kids who are gonna run you a piece of chocolate if you get the right answer, all right? All right, so remember, we have Jonah, and he is a prophet, and God says to Jonah what? What does God first say to Jonah in the beginning, Jonah chapter one? Does anybody remember? Oh, go to Nineveh, okay. Oh, take the candy. Oh. There you go. Get the chocolate. Get the chocolate. Okay. <laughs> All right. So God says, go to Nineveh and tell the people there to repent. And what does Jonah say? Oh, a couple of chocolates. A couple of chocolates. If you said no over from that side of the room with the youth there, here, take some chocolate back there. Oh, look. Oh, look. The whole table. The whole table. Here, Skylar, go get more chocolate. See? See, you should answer correctly. That's what you, Okay. So Jonah says no, and God says, well, <laughs> Jonah says no, and Jonah doesn't really like the people of Nineveh because he says, you know, the people there are smelly, and I just don't like the climate there. It's really humid. My beard's going to be all frizzy. And I just don't want to go. And so God says, I don't care. I want you to go anyway. So then what does Jonah do? God's like, I don't care. I want you to go anyway. What does Jonah do? Oh, lots of, lots of answers. I heard some from over at that table. And I heard some from this side of the room. Oh, and all the way in the back. Look, all the way in the back, Mr. Fred's table. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> And I'm sorry for those of you online, I have no way to get you any chocolate, but a chocolate emoji right to you for getting the right answer there. <laughs> All right, so Jonah decides to run away, and he decides that he's going to board a boat to where? Oh, Pastor Joel's not missing out on his candy. <laughs> All right, so he's going to go to Tarshish, and so he boards a boat to the complete opposite direction, right? Um, then when he's on the boat, what happens? What does God do? He brings a storm. More chocolate for the youth table. That's what I'm saying. Sugar them right up. There you go. All right. So God sends a big storm, and the boat is going to sink, and the sailors are like, what are we going to do? And Jonah then says what? What should, what should 
what does Jonah say to do? This table is, this table is awesome, I just want to tell you. Right now they're winning. <laughs> All right, so they, right, so the sail, or Jonah says, I know, it's my fault, throw me into the water. And so they do, and then what happens? Right, he goes, oh, that's a lot of candy. I don't know if we can get it to everybody, but takes them back. Right, so Jonah gets swallowed by a whale, right, and the storm stops, and it's calm, right. So then Jonah's in the whale for three days, right, getting all nice and stinky, and then the whale spits him up, and then God says, Jonah, I told you to go to Nineveh, and then Jonah's like, all right, fine, my beard is already a mess from being in the whale, so I'm just going to go. So he goes to Nineveh, and he preaches to the people of Nineveh there, and what happens? Do the people of Nineveh listen to him? They repent. This table again, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. Oh, oh, look, look, Skylar's just throwing candy at them. <laughs> right, so the people repent, and the city is saved, and that sounds like a great ending to the book, right? but that was only to Jonah chapter three. All right, so thank you to my kids. Thank you to this table, who is completely awesome, and to the youth. You guys did a great job remembering the story. Okay, so I am now gonna pick it up at Jonah chapter four. So God saves the city, and he's like, yay, I didn't have to destroy it. That was a lot of work. I didn't wanna do it anyway. And so isn't that great? And here's Jonah's reaction. It's in Jonah chapter four, if you wanna turn there, you can. Now remember, Jonah is only like one page long in the Bible, so it's, gonna, it's a little tricky to find. It's in with like Obadiah and Micah if you're looking for it. If you have this Bible, it's on, I'm on page 646 if you wanna look at that. Anyway, um, so page 646 in this Bible, Jonah chapter four. Jonah, um, to Jonah, the saving of the city, it says, to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. And he prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home, that I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish? I knew that you are gracious and compassionate, God. You're slow to anger. You're abounding in love. You're a God who relents from, from sending calamity. And now, Lord, take away my life for it's better for me to die than to live. A little dramatic if you ask me. But anyway, the Lord, the Lord replies, Jonah, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah went out, I'm gonna put this part in. Jonah went out and he pouted, right? Because it's probably what we would all do in this situation. But he goes out and he sits down to the place east of the city and there he made himself a shelter and he sat in the shade and he waited to see what would happen to the city. And the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow over Jonah to give shade um, for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm, which chewed up the plant, and it withered. And when the sun rose, God provided a strong, scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint, and he wanted to die. It would be better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And Jonah says, it is. And I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you've been concerned about this plant, though you didn't make it grow. It sprang up overnight and it died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh in which there were more than 120,000 people who can't tell their right hand from their left and also many animals. So we see this, um, we see this story, and I, you know, again, I think that Jonah is a little dramatic, and we don't really know what happens next. Um, we don't know if Jonah then came to his senses, because the story just ends right where I ended it. So we don't know if he came to his senses and he continued to serve God. We don't know if he just kind of gave up and was like, all right, well, that was fun, and move on to his next thing. We just don't really know. But I think when we all look at this story, if we're really honest with ourselves, we can all relate to Jonah in, in the moment. I mean, maybe we're not all as dramatic as Jonah. We don't all want to die because of our circumstances. But I think there are times in our life where we're just so like disgusted by a circumstance or a relationship, a person, um, 
or maybe our family or something like that, that we can all kind of relate to, to that moment where we're just kind of fed up. And if we're honest, we can also think of a time when we were ungrateful. Now, in the moment, ingratitude is not something that we as humans really are good at seeing in ourselves. We don't kind of go about the day where things might not be going as planned, and we don't say to ourselves, you know, I know what the problem is here. I'm being ungrateful. We don't really, really want to identify that in ourselves. And if someone came up to me and said, Heather, I think you're being really ungrateful, I think I would get a little defensive. I'd be like, what do you mean I'm ungrateful? And I would, <laughs> I would start to list all of these things that I'm grateful for, right, to the point that maybe I would stop being ungrateful. I don't know, but we, we all tend to do that, that type of thing. We don't want to be called ungrateful. Yet, we can easily identify ingratitude in others. In fact, you might be sitting here today and you're like, I'm so glad that my kids are here to hear this message. <laughs> Or you might be saying, I'm so glad that my husband came with me today. Or you might be saying, how can I send this link anonymously to my boss online so that they can <laughs> listen to this message? So we can all pick it out in other people. And, um, but it's very difficult to identify in ourselves. And that brings us to our bottom line. And that is that gratitude tells us the condition of our heart. And that's why it's so easy to pick out. Um, in other people, but not so much in ourselves. Gratitude is kind of like an EKG for the spiritual condition of your heart. And an EKG is a test that, that doctors do for your heart to see if it's functioning properly and if all the channels are working. And um, when we look at our lives and we look at our attitude and gratitude in our lives, we can see what the spiritual condition of our heart is. So when our heart is in bad condition, we have a really hard time being grateful. And sometimes we're really able to compartmentalize that. Like we might be grateful in a lot of areas of our life. We might be grateful, you know, with our family. We might be grateful with our neighbors, maybe with our church. But, you know, we're just don't have a very good uh, attitude about our boss, maybe. And so maybe at work, we're, we're not very grateful when we're working or serving at our job. And... Um, we have to understand that ingratitude or a, an ungrateful heart is actually a sinful heart. And the Bible tells us in multiple places that we need to give thanks to the Lord for he is good. It's in Psalm 107, it's in Psalm 118, Psalm 136. There's a lot of places where it says to give thanks to the Lord for he is good. And then in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 15 to 18, it says, See fit that no one repays evil for evil. But always pursue what is good for one another and for all. Rejoice always. Pray constantly. Give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So ingratitude happens when we believe that God is withholding good from us, or we think that we know better than God. And when we look at Jonah in this chapter, he, he thinks that he knows better than God. He thinks that the people of Nineveh should be destroyed because they were evil and wicked. And our God is a God of mercy and compassion, and his desire is that no one should perish. And so we as humans don't know what's better, and we have to really choose to accept that. And here's the first thing that I want you to write down in your notes. It's gratitude is voluntary. Gratitude is voluntary. So we're not forced to be grateful. Now, we might be forced to say thank you. And I know this as a mom. My kids are pretty good now, but when they were little especially, I had a lot of in the moments where I would say, what do you say? what do you say, right? Even sometimes your teenagers, what do you say? You know, right? You want to make sure that they're, they're saying thankful, thank you and being grateful. But really, we can only teach them what to say. We can't teach them necessarily to be grateful just by saying thank you. Um, <clears throat> so gratitude is a choice we make that takes the focus off of ourselves and it acknowledges the sacrifice of another. So, in fact, when we don't express our gratitude, it can feel like rejection. 
So I'm going to just share a little scenario here. I will put a disclaimer. This has not actually happened in my home, so please do not think that it does. But something similar, I'm sure, has happened in some env family environment that you might be familiar with. So think about a situation like this. You decide that your, or your mom decides that she's gonna make a really nice dinner for your family. Like everybody's home, there's no practices tonight to run to. So, you know, everybody's favorite meal that maybe takes a little extra preparation. She had to go to two stores because they were out of a certain ingredient. She makes the whipped cream from scratch, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and so she's really gone about preparing this meal, spent a lot of time. She could have been doing something else with her afternoon, but she decided to spend the time to make this meal. And so she makes the meal, and then she calls everyone to the table, and family member number one comes down and says, oh, you know what? I just ate earlier, so I'm really not that hungry, so uh, I'll, I'm going to head out. So mom's like, oh, all right. And family member two comes down, and family member two says, you know what? The, the playoff game is on right now, so you don't mind if I, if I take this meal and I just go sit in the other room and just watch the playoff game, right? You're fine with that, right? And so then family number three might come down and they say, oh, you know what? I already made plans with my friend. I'm going to go out to eat. And so here mom is, and she's prepared this beautiful meal, maybe even got out the cloth napkins or something like that, and now nobody wants her meal, and nobody even said thank you. And so she's feeling maybe a little rejected, and so maybe she starts to clean up. Family doesn't really notice what's going on, you know. Then she starts to maybe slam things into the dishwasher, maybe sets the pot down a little bit too hard. And then somebody comes into the kitchen and says, Mom, what's wrong? <laughs> right? 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 Right, because they didn't know. They, they essentially have rejected her in that moment where she has gone about preparing this special meal. Again, this has not happened in my home, so don't think my kids and my husband are bad. They're not. <laughs> it's just not happened in my home. But I think we can all relate to some element of that. But don't we do this to God all of the time? Like, God gives us all of these blessings, like of our job, of our home, our opportunity for education, the fact that you live in the United States of America, the fact that people say, I love you, that are around you. We do this all the time to God. We, do, we barely even think about saying thank you to God for all of these things in our lives. And when we don't say thanks to God, we are in essence rejecting him because we're not acknowledging his, um, his blessings in our life. And it can become even more dangerous than that. We can develop pride in our hearts, thinking that we are responsible for all of these things in our life, when in fact, we are not. And the Bible says that pride often comes before a fall. And so the next thing I want you to write down is that gratitude requires humility. So we have to take our eyes off of ourselves and off of our circumstances and focus on the one who gave it all for us. Case in point, our kids, right? When our kids are getting that birthday present and they're so excited to rip open the package, they didn't even look at the card. We as parents are like, you got to say thank you because you have to acknowledge the sacrifice of the person who brought it and say thank you and express that gratitude. So they have to take the focus off of themselves and think of the other person. And it, um, we have to remember when we're doing this with God that every good and perfect gift comes from above, and that's found in James one chapter seven. Or, sorry, James chapter one verse seventeen. It says, "Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, who does not change like shifting shadows." So we can see this with Jonah. Jonah is not humble in this moment, right? He's focused all on himself. Like he wants to die. He's so angry that God saved these people of Nineveh and he gave them a second chance. But Jonah has quickly forgotten that God gave him a second chance, right? He deliberately disobeyed God. He was deliberately sinning by running away from God and God gave him a second chance, he saved him from drowning. Granted, he got swallowed by a whale, but he saved him from drowning. He gave him a second chance to go and preach to the people of Nineveh. And then, I mean, what better thing? Like when you share that God loves you to somebody else and that he wants to save you, and then they actually listen, 
Like, doesn't that validate what God has told you? But Jonah doesn't care at that point. He's like, they should die. You know, I want to die. I'm just so mad that you're going to save these people that don't deserve it. So in that moment, he's not humble. He can't think that that these people may, um, may not be saved when they would have all been destroyed. And God challenges him on it. And he says, Jonah, do you really have the right to be angry about this? And First, whenever God asks him that, Jonah doesn't answer. He just kind of goes about and pouts. At least it's not written in here that he answers. And I think we sometimes do that, right? When God challenges us on something, we just are like, okay. (laughs) Just walk the other way, right? We don't answer. But do we really think that God doesn't know our heart? That God doesn't see our attitude? That God doesn't, um, that he doesn't know? Um. So we have to be authentic in our gratitude. And we've already kind of established that gratitude isn't something that really comes naturally. So we have to cultivate a grateful heart. And we need to to do some work in order to do that. We have to choose to take out time and acknowledge God and his blessings in our life. And as I was doing some research about this, there's actually a Jewish custom where you give thanks to God 100 times a day. Could you imagine giving thanks to God 100 times a day? So they have a lot of different um, prayers that they say or little phrases that they say when they first wake up, that thanks be to God when they first see the sun, when they get dressed, you get the idea. And so, you know, maybe that's a a great theory, but maybe not in real life practice for us. Maybe we can either do that or maybe we could not literally count how many times we say thank you to God in a day, but maybe we have to set aside some time where we thank God for the things that, that he has given to us and the blessings in our life, where we, we just reflect and we, we think of all the blessings and write them down. Um, maybe we need to share it with our family, not just on Thanksgiving. That's a custom that many of us do. We're sitting around the Thanksgiving table and we say, I'm thankful for this, I'm thankful for that. But maybe this is something that we do not just one day a year, but another 364 days out of the year. So whatever it is, we have to regularly practice our gratitude. And when we regularly practice our gratitude, there's a couple of things that happen. And this next thing is what you can write down. Gratitude preserves our trust in God. When we focus on putting God in his rightful place in our lives, when we have one of those days where, you know, your kids are making you late because they can't find the shoes that they want to wear, and then you go to Starbucks and they give you the wrong order, and then someone cuts you off in traffic, and then your boss blames you for something that you had completely no control over. Um, We, at that moment, need to call on our practiced gratitude and trust God in those circumstances because otherwise we can allow our emotions um, and reactions to control our day and we are not in control of our behavior. And if we practice gratitude and trust in God, then we can have joy in spite of our circumstances. And when I was thinking about it, there's kind of like um, gratitude is kind of like a a vaccine in life for those things that just don't work out the way that you've planned. And I know there's a lot of talk about the vaccine for COVID-19 and preventing illness and gratitude can prevent Um, a bad heart, essentially, by practicing that on a regular basis. So if we think about our friend Jonah, if he was able to be grateful for what God, for grateful that God saved his life and gave him a second chance and helping him to find favor with the people in Nineveh, then maybe he wouldn't have been so angry to the point he just wanted to die, right? Right, because that, that reaction doesn't make sense. Maybe bitterness would have not taken up root in his heart, maybe he would have appreciated the fact that thousands of lives were spared in that moment. Maybe he could have been even more effective and maybe more people would have been saved. Maybe his chapter would be longer than one page in the Bible (laughs) if he was more grateful. So the next thing that, when we have that heart of gratitude, the next thing and the last thing that you can write down is gratitude, gratitude sustains our faith. 
So when we thank God for what he's done in our lives, that requires humility. But when we thank God for what he's going to do in our life, that's faith. And that's placing what we cannot control into his hands. And that's knowing that God cares for all of us. And that he'll provide for us even when we can't see how. And so as we kind of get ready to wrap up for today, I wanted to give you a few minutes to reflect. And I put some index cards on your table. And in a moment, you can grab those. And if you're sitting in the rows, they're under the chairs on this end. So feel free to grab and, and pass down. Um, so I want to just put a, out a couple of challenges before we do this um, time of reflection here. Maybe this week, your challenge is that you want to thank God 100 times a day. But maybe that seems like a lot. And so maybe you'll try something else. Maybe this week you will try every day to write down 15 things that you are grateful for. And for those of you who are OCD, that is 105 things that you will write down if you do it all seven days. So over the course of the week. Um, but I want to encourage you, before you get started with it, to not write generic things like... I mean, maybe you can write a few if you're going to do 100. But I want you to think about something specific that you're grateful for. So again, not just like the sunshine or a good meal or your house, but something specific. And I'll give you an example. So for those of you who don't know, I'm a physical therapist. And a while ago now, before my kids, um, I was working at a job and I actually got fired. Can you believe it? So... Anyway, I've, if you know me at all, that is not something that sits well with me because I'm very much a do it well or don't do it kind of a person. Um, so I, I got fired from my job, and it was, a, it was a difficult couple of days, at least, at my house. But uh, looking back, I'm actually extremely grateful for it, and this is why. They're at the job that I was working at, the clinic I was working at, I was discovering that there were some unethical billing practices that were going on, and I wasn't really sure how to handle it because as a physical therapist, I bill, and I'm responsible for those bills, even though I'm not actually submitting them. So there was some questionable practices that I had brought to the attention of my manager, and they kind of like brushed them under the rug, and we knew that we were going to be moving in about six months. So my own self, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to stick it out for six months. It's, then I'll be gone, and, you know, that's a good time for me to leave. So I got called into the, uh, my, uh, my uh, office manager's office uh, on Friday after work, and he was like, you know, Heather, we don't need you to come back to work on Monday. And I was like, huh? Um, and the, the practice had been not making very wise decisions, not just in billing, but also with relationships with some of the referral sources. And so our patient volume was going down, so we all kind of knew that they were going to have to make some kind of adjustments. And, you know, I was probably a very likely choice since they knew that I was going to be leaving in six months anyway. So anyway, they fired me from my job, so I was kind of upset about it. But as I look back on it, what ended up happening is I started to work for a contract company, um, which is kind of like a substitute therapist. So I went to a couple different clinics, and then the place that I went last and served at the longest was the University of Penn. And so I worked in the outpatient clinic there, and it was an amazing experience for me. So I worked there for six months, and I, I just loved it there. It was like my, one of my dream dream jobs, but I was just a contractor, so I was trying not to get too attached. And the way that contracting works is you either need to, if the company wants to keep you on, they either have to buy out your contract or you can't work for them for one year. So Jeff and I moved away, and I was working away, and then we found out about 11 months or whatever later that we were going to be moving back to the area. So I was like, huh. So I'm, I had several contacts at University of Penn, and I was able to um, get a job in an outpatient clinic that actually wasn't downtown, so now it was even more my ideal job because it was a Penn site and still had all the bells and whistles without the traffic and train of going downtown. And actually, many years, I went part-time for them when I had my kids, and now I work for Penn Medicine at home. 
And as I look back over that circumstance, I'm so thankful that I got fired because I didn't want to bill unethically and I didn't want to be in that environment, but I didn't, really, I didn't really know how to get out of it. But I can tell you, it felt absolutely terrible in the moment um, when it happened. But looking back, I'm really grateful. So as you're writing your, your gratitude on there, I want you to be somewhat specific, at least for one thing. So on the card, just, you can just write one thing. You can share a little bit at your tables if you want. Maybe that's really easy for you. Maybe you're like, oh, I know right away what I'm going to write. And maybe you need a second challenge. So your second challenge is going to be to think of someone in your life whom you are grateful for, and specifically why are you grateful for them. So not, mom, thanks for all the things you do for me, but mom, thanks specifically for, like my mom this morning, she texted me early this morning and she said, I'm praying for you. I'm praying that God's gonna use your words this morning and I'm really grateful to my mom for her love and care in my life, that she's so interested in that and that she prays for me every day. So specifically, that's what I'm grateful for from my mom. So we're going to give you a few minutes. You can do it at your, you can talk at your tables. You can reflect by yourself. You can get together in your rows. But we're going to give you a few minutes to do that. And then uh, Pastor Susan's going to come up and close us out.